let's let's assume that everything is working just fine because <laughs> the technology never lets us down. No. <laughs> you should know that better than anyone, Adam. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, right. Yeah, right? Yes. Deal? Boing. Welcome to the Acquia Podcast, Drupal Technology, Community and Business. Welcome to the Acquia Podcast, Drupal Technology, Community and Business. There's a module for that? There, of course there is. This is a little thing I like to call Jams Dev Camp. Today at Jams Dev Camp, we are going to have a session about the origins, creation, uh, building, maintenance of a little Drupal project called GovCMS for the Australian government. I have with me today Adam Malone from Acquia, who's been involved with a lot of that project, and I'm really, really excited to see that session. A word about Jams Dev Camp. There are a lot of smart people in our community with a lot of great ideas, and we like to share those at Drupal camps, at Drupal cons, at other open source events. But a lot of them get lost, and I would like to try and capture a few of them and share them with you so that we have a canonical source for this information so that people can find it, come back to it. So this podcast recording is an introduction to a session, and it's all going to be published on acquia.com, and there'll be the podcast interview there, Adam's session description, a post that I'm going to write about it, uh, links and references, Adam's slides, and the entire session video will all be on acquia.com. You can find it at slash podcasts, and you can also find it at the Jams Dev Camp landing page. <laughs> all right, this is Jams Dev Camp. If you haven't heard the podcast introduction to this session, please go find it on acquia.com slash podcast. I have been talking with Adam Malone, a solutions architect in Canberra, Australia, who works for Acquia and works on GovCMS with the Australian government. Adam's going to be talking with us today about that and presenting a session about the origin and creation of GovCMS. Adam, share your screen and take it away. Thanks, Jim. All right. So, GovCMS, uh, Government as a Service. Quick introduction to myself, um, Adam Malone, Solutions Architect with Acquia uh, in Asia Pacific and Japan. Uh, my Twitter handle is at Adam Malone, so first name, last name. If you have any questions about GovCMS or want to know how to get involved, then um, feel free to reach out to me there. So, a little bit more about me. I'm about four and a bit in terms of Drupal years. Uh, got in, uh, got into Drupal and logged into Drupal.org for the very first time about four and a bit years ago. I'm a trivial patch of the month winner. I'm an emoji adept, and I broke Drupal.org with emojis. And I'm Typhonius most places online. If you do Google me, um, what I didn't, what I didn't realize was that Typhonius was a species of toad. So just be aware that the top three, they're me, but the other ones with the toad pictures, they're, they're not me. So a little bit about GovCMS. These are the things which I'd like to sort of cover and make sure that by the end of the session, everyone's aware of. What is GovCMS? Why the Australian federal government chose Drupal and why public cloud? What has been learned throughout the, the, uh, the GovCMS build process? How we, how we as the GovCMS team are aiming to be off the island, off the Drupal island? And what is in store for GovCMS and Drupal in Australia in future? So in the beginning, um, a couple of years ago and before that, a lot of the pain points in the Australian government, a lot of pain points in each department was that they were siloed. They were their own individual agencies running their own technology stack from top to bottom and not having a lot of sharing or, or sort of uh, sharing of ideas between departments. So this led to you know, a, lot of, a lot of sort of technical debt when someone left the department and went and joined another department no one would really know what, what the system was. New people coming in would have to learn a brand new thing. And, um, and there wouldn't be any kind, of, any kind of way of training people on one generic solution or one generic platform. This has changed recently. 
to um, to sort of encapsulate um, a modern approach to digital strategy and a modern approach to technology. So the DTO, the Digital Transformation Office within the Australian government, has laid out these these sort of very generic rules for what a website should look like, what the online engagement with citizens and residents of a, a country should look like in future. So there's policies for e-government, there's policies for digital economy, there's policies for open source, for cloud computing, public cloud, and policies for um, for sort of service service design for agencies. These these all together led to what became GovCMS. It's this rethink about online. It's this rethink about procurement and reducing the, the time it takes to go through a tender procedure. And it's also about open source and about how we actually go out to you know different agencies, how they develop their code, and how that code is supported. So what actually were some of the criteria for GovCMS? What actually led the Australian government to choosing Drupal? Um, one of their criteria was to have an open source content management framework or system in public cloud. So the, the other stipulation was that it wasn't .NET and it wasn't Ruby. Don't ask me why they said not .NET and not Ruby, but they were some of the things in the, uh, in the initial proposal. Those two different factors filtered down into a short list of 18 different, uh, different systems. Um, amongst those, obviously, Drupal, but also a number of other open source technologies um, that were that were sort of shortlisted. The final three from that shortlist, the finalists, were Drupal, Magnolia, and LifeRay. The reason that Drupal was chosen, the reason that Drupal was placed number one out of those three, and number one out of any different public um, public cloud and open source collaboration that that entered, was pretty much four different um, four different things. By far, Drupal has the largest community of developers and contributors from any any of those three, but also any of those open source systems. It's it's a pretty openly um, sort of quoted fact that Drupal almost has this this um, largest this largest community in in the world for open source, um, larger even than sort of Linux. Um, for Australia, it also has the largest number of companies who do development for it. So comparing Drupal with these other content management systems, the largest number of companies who develop in Drupal um, are, are in, you know, Australia has the, the largest number of those. Also, tangential to that, the largest number of freelancers. So it's not just companies that develop in Drupal, but it's freelancers as well. And the final point is the extensibility of the module system. It's this ability to say, I want this piece of package functionality. I want this, um, you know, I want this, this thing that connects me up to this other service. In, term, in terms of Drupal, more often than not, it has that functionality. If it doesn't have that functionality, then it's pretty easy to actually get there and, um, and add that kind of thing to your site. So taking these criteria, taking us down into Drupal, what is GovCMS and, and where does Drupal play a part in that? So GovCMS is these is these sort of four main components, but also a few others which we'll we'll talk about a little bit later on this in this session. So GovCMS is the GovCMS SaaS platform. It's the software as a service platform hosted on Acquia Cloud Sack Factory, uh, which itself is hosted on AWS. It's the GovCMS distribution, which is the Drupal code base plus a bunch of contrib modules, plus a bunch of package functionality, which we think would be really applicable for government. So perhaps you know a, a, a very specific government module that might not be uh, applicable to you know, a media company or a school or something. It's the GovCMS deed. It's this thing which allows different agencies, different government um, departments to engage with the Department of Finance and lower their time to market, lower the time it takes for them to Go through procurement and get on to get onto the platform and have this public website. And it's also the professional services arrangement, which um, also comes with GovCMS. It's this ability to say, we're a small department, we're a small agency. How do we get on here? How do we develop our site? How do we go through the agile development procedure? Um, and and you know, we have no in-house devs, help us out. So it's that agreement as well. So out of the box, when you come onto the GovCMS platform, you get all of these things. You get a Drupal, con you, get, you get a Drupal site on this platform. You get all of the security surrounding the platform. So all thing, all uh, assessment 
and, um, and grading against government standards. You get the public cloud, so it's not locked away behind closed doors, it's not in someone's basement somewhere, it's on this scalable, elastic environment that allows it to meet demand and, um, and never have these, these issues where you know, a, 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 massive, uh, a massive attack comes against it or, or um, you know, massive floods of traffic and it goes down because it can't handle it, it's on this elastic environment. You get the GovCMS deed, as I mentioned before. You get the ability to learn about Agile, to use Agile and use it in the proper fashion. You get these design standards and accessibility, meeting WCAG, um, WCAG uh, compliance. And you get all the services surrounding both GovCMS, the platform, the code base, and professional services arrangements. So talking a little bit more about open source, where does security come in? Where does reuse come in? How does open source benefit the Australian government and different departments who are on there? So in terms of security, the Australian Signals Directorate, the ASD, has put in place um, this thing called IRAP. It's an information security registered assessors program, basically something which you would run against your website, your department, your in-house servers, um, and check that they're up to ASD requirements. Um, this is all vetted against the ISM, which is the Information Security Manual. And we, we've we had go, both GovCMS, the ACSF platform, and AWS vetted against all these things to ensure that it meets security requirements. By coming onto this platform, we're open sourcing the, um, the sort of the ability to come onto a secure environment. So um, all of these things are taken care of. There's no need to go through security procedures and have IRAP assessments done to yourself because it's all done against the platform as it is. Reuse, we, we don't want to have people reinvent the wheel. We've gone from, from this, airy, this sort of era of siloed development between agencies, and we're wanting people to start reusing each other's code and reusing each other's experience. We've got this rich pool of resources in the entire Drupal community, in the entire world, for sort of PHP developers and Drupal developers, so let's use them. Let's, um, let's sort of use those developers, and let's contribute back to them. We want to get off the island, so we're not going to be locked into this sort of pure Drupal platform. We're going to be using lots of other open source tooling. And one of the other things that the Australian government was very, very keen on was to have no vendor lock-in. They wanted the ability to take sites off if they exceeded the demand, if they wanted to go on their own way, um, but also to, to have sort of complete access to the code, the database and files. And obviously with Drupal and with open source, that's something which is locked in. So a little bit more about security. These are all the things that GovCMS has by default. So there's no insecure port 80 HTTP requests. It's HTTPS everywhere by default. The minute you come onto GovCMS, you are HTTPS everywhere. Um, there's whitelisting. There's all sorts of different security requirements that we had to fulfill to get the IRAP assessment. And those are all baked into the platform. Those are all baked into the GovCMS code base. And it requires no sort of extra extra interaction or extra assessment or extra auditing by different agencies. The minute they're on GovCMS, they are IRAP assessed, they're on a secure platform, and they're ready to put their content up. Um, one of the other things which uh, is, is of a lot of value to different agencies is this prepackaged DDoS and CDN service that, that GovCMS provides. So the Australian federal government have engaged with DDoS and CDN providers to protect the entire GovCMS platform from DDoS and allow uh, content to be distributed across the world with a CDN um, just out of the box. One of the, one of the core benefits to this is that, again, there's no need to go through a procurement process for each of those individual things. It's all in this one single platform. Principle three of the Australian government's open source software policy. It's this idea of reusing before buying before building. If there's a platform which has Drupal on, which has security assessment, which has functionality to go out to your um, to your residents and your citizens of the country, then don't bother building it yourself. Don't bother buying a platform yourself. Reuse something that already exists. Come onto the GovCMS platform, reuse this code base, and allow that functionality that one agency creates, those modules that one agency um, develops, to be used by everyone else. If you develop some modules for GovCMS, if they get into the GovCMS platform, then instantly, as soon as they're available to you, they're available to everyone else. It's this constantly evolving platform that everyone reaps the benefits of being on. So the more sites, the more departments, the more agencies that come onto the platform, the more everyone benefits. And in turn, as we'll, as we'll sort of learn later on in this presentation, the entire Australian people 
and uh, as the entire Drupal community will benefit from them as well. One thing we did learn about um, governance, actually, um, through throughout this this development procedure for GovCMS, we we learned that governance is is actually really important uh, in maintaining a distribution. That this GovCMS platform, this project, this this entire entire um, procedure would need to be held in place by a governance procedure. So we have these two sort of different organizations, which are a pairing of the federal government and representatives from the federal government and also representatives from, from sort of Drupal and Acquia who come together and um, provide input for the GovCMS platform. So we have this group called GEOPS, which sounds like a special forces unit, but, but actually isn't. Um, this is sort of the government operations team. These are the more technical people who take a look at requirements from different agencies. They take a look at what agencies are asking for and they define solutions for these that would work within a GovCMS context. We also have this group called CAB, who, yep, they're not taxi people, they are the change approval board. Um, these people are the business owners, the stakeholders within the government who say this functionality is absolutely needed by the entirety of government. These are people who have been working in the government for you know decades, for, for several years, and they know what, what is needed by government. So the pairing of technical with stakeholder and, and sort of managerial goes to define these, these requirements and goes to ensure that everything that goes into the GovCMS platform is both needed and of best practices. These requirements um, are really key for driving platform evolution. The last thing we want is for someone to say, hey, we need the X module and someone to say, oh, okay, let's just put the X module in without, without any kind of thought process to how this will affect all the sites on the GovCMS platform as it is. So we have this really strong documentation procedure within, within, our, govern, within our governance process that makes sure that any additions to the code base are documented. Any sort of way that, that we're improving the functionality is goes through a procedure and we can ensure that it will contribute to the overall health of the platform. We also ensure that any deployment, because we're deploying to many, many tens of sites at the same time, will go without hindrance. So we have this, this procedure for platform deployment and also for sort of security um, audits and accreditation as well. So internally within each site, we wanna make sure that everything is configured in a way that is compliant with the, um, the IRAP assessment against the ISM. We need to make sure that you know, we're giving people these sites, we're giving departments these sites that have HTTPS by default, that have, you know, Shield configured and on by default when people are developing, and that things like Climb AV are there and they're ready, they're ready to sort of um, be the antivirus of choice for GovCMS. So we've gone through the problem. We've gone through this siloed approach. We've gone through where we were in the past to where we're going in the future. We're looking to leapfrog these giants. We take a look at people like the whitehouse.gov, one of the first major high profile, prominent security risk Drupal websites that existed online. Huge high priority target that is obviously Gone, you know, it's obviously going to be uh, an attack vector for anyone wishing to make a scene. If the White House says, let's use Drupal, let's go all in on Drupal, let's put all of our public websites, our petition site, our main, our main sort of, um, you know, White House front page site, let's put these on Drupal. What we can do is we can take hint from that and say, these people have decided to put their high priority site on. Let's use that in the Australian government as an example for you know, a Drupal site on public cloud um, existing in, in, in our space. We can also take a look at gov.uk. So the entire UK government decided to put their, put, their, um, put their sites on an open source public cloud in the UK. Both of these two sites, they act as great examples. What we want to do is we want to take their examples and we want to surpass that. We want to provide this open source service built in Drupal, hosted on public cloud to any government department at any level, state, local, or federal, who wants to join the platform. And this is then gonna in turn serve as an amazing example for other government agencies around the world, people in New Zealand, people in Singapore, people in the rest of Europe, to look at this as an example and say, well, if they're doing it, if they're putting all their cards on the table and saying, we're going all in with Drupal, all in with open source, why can't we? 
So a little bit of a closer look at, at how we architect the Gulf CMS platform and how they all combine together with this Gulf CMS core to, um, to define the requirements that we need for that. And this, this really harkens back to our CAB, our change approval board, and the different requirements that, that each site might need. So as I mentioned before, what we want to do is we want to make sure that anything that comes into the GovCMS platform, any individual requirement, whether that's for an events calendar, all the way up to going into sort of, you know, services API and RESTful web services, is going to be useful to the entire government. We want to make sure that different content types that we provide packaged out of the box with features are going to be available and ready for all different government departments. And then we're not providing Croft, we're not providing things that the majority of government won't need just because one government department says, we need this done in this way. So it's this whole governance procedure that has led us to how the code base itself has been architected, how we've taken you know, really strong foundations and really strong Drupal contrib modules and, and, and the distribution that we, we uh, architected this from and move this into the GovCMS um, distribution itself. So anything that comes out of the box in the GovCMS distribution, what we're what we're making sure and what we're what we're confident of is that it will be of benefit to any government department that joins in, and that they can extend it themselves through the UI without any kind of code to meet their requirements. This leads on to the idea of patterns, and patterns is a John Sheridan, the Australian government CIO, um, invention. What do patterns mean for GovCMS? Pattern one, it's any site that comes to us and says, we meet the requirements 100%. What you're providing to us in GovCMS, all the features and all the functionality, anything codey, these things are met 100%. So, you know, we have the ability to have event calendars, we have the ability to have news policy content types, we have all the fields that we need 100%. These people, they can develop their site directly on GovCMS, directly on the platform, directly on the code base to have this one-to-one -one matching between what their requirements are and what we can provide. Pattern two is this transitionary state. The platform evolves to meet the requirements of a pattern two site. These people might say, look, GovCMS doesn't have 100% of the functionality that we need right now. It's got 99%. And that 1%, that would be something of benefit to the entire platform. So, you know, it might be some kind of, you know, web service or it might be some kind of theme hook or something that the entire government, the entire government and everyone on the platform would gain benefit out of. What happens then is we evolve the platform, we put that functionality in, those features in to meet their requirements, and then suddenly they're back to being a pattern one state. The platform has evolved to meet their requirements, and suddenly they are a one-to-one -one match with the GovCMS platform. The third and final type of pattern is this, this custom, this custom, um, this custom idea of, of, of a site. This might have something which has nothing else that all of these other government departments require. It might have, you know, all of this custom integration with all back office systems and CRMs that we don't quite match up with yet in GovCMS. The idea with pattern three sites, as you can see from this diagram, is that they'll go off, they'll, they'll take the GovCMS core code base, they'll go off, they'll host it maybe on their own systems, maybe on Acquia Cloud that's, that's already been, you know, security vet and things, and they will take that GovCMS code base develop on top of that, and maybe at some point in future, maybe way, way down the line when GovCMS has evolved further and further and further, or maybe government require requirements have changed or their department requirements have changed, we'd love to bring them back into the GovCMS platform to have them all under this, this one roof, um, which will just make sort of code management, distribution management, and governance of this platform easier for everyone. So talking about GovCMS architecture and how the platform, how the distribution is actually built, what we do is we, we're sort of using this multi-layered approach to take uh, the infrastructure for the GovCMS platform, which is built on Acquia Cloud, on the Acquia Cloud site factory, building on top of that with GovCMS core, which consists of Drupal and a few patches specifically for GovCMS. And then on top of that, we take our contributor modules from the community, and we also take our GovCMS modules as well. Um, the key thing that's required here is that the government is in control of the code base. So if you take a look at, at uh, GitHub or if you take a look at Drupal.org, both of these projects are in the hands of the government. It's not me who, who sort of owns these projects on Drupal.org or GitHub. 
it's not Acquia, it's not any sort of third party or partner, it's the government that, that has ownership of these. Um, so it, it's them who defines how this code base moves and evolves, and, um, and we just sort of provide our input on the governance and on the infrastructure there. So what about patches? How do we, how do we make changes to GovCMS? What happens if a security release comes out as they want to do every Thursday morning? What happens when a bug is, is found and it needs to be developed? What we do is we have regularly scheduled releases um, to the GovCMS platform. We make sure that we're doing this rolling release procedure for all the, all the sites on the platform utilizing that code base. So anyone who has sort of, you know, put their, put their cards down and said, I want to be a part of this platform, isn't waiting for you know days, weeks, months for new features to come out. As soon as they're in the code base, they go through a re review process and then they're deployed to the platform. So there's a really quick turnaround time between requesting that feature, getting that feature developed, and having it out on the platform. Similarly, that allows us to be prepared for those hot fixes. It allows us to act quickly on those security releases from Drupal.org. You know, any kind of different vulnerability that comes out on a Thursday, we can get that out to the platform on that Thursday to make sure that all of those government departments, everyone has that peace of mind that any issues that they have with security, any sort of compliance things that they might might need to uh, adhere to, they're going to be they're going to be taken care of by our rolling release schedule. So typical phrase in the community is there's a module for that. And this is something which I think has been a great benefit to anyone developing a Drupal site. You know, you can look at a, a requirement and you can say, hey, uh, there's a module for that. There's something which already does the thing that you need it for. We've taken that idea with GovCMS and we, we've sort of, you know, put this into our governance procedure and we, we really sort of making sure that while there may be a module for that, it will be of good value and it will be of benefit to the entire platform. Um, really, this, this whole idea of there's a module for that, what we don't want to happen is for people to ask for a specific module, for developers and an agency to say, you know what, we need the um, departmental underscore GovCMS underscore web form underscore fix everything module. We want them to ask, we want to ask what their functionality is. We want them to propose a problem to us, which could be we need these fields here to be saved into the database um, on GovCMS so we can propose a, a solution for that. So, you know, an idea like I, I need an email sent out when a content item needs approval, we'd look at that and we'd say, well, actually, this is something that can be done in the UI. This is something which we can solve without going through a development procedure. And this is something which we can assist and, and enable you to do yourself. If it's something which is at a more code level, then we consider the entire platform and we make sure that any kind of module or any kind of functionality that goes into that, into that uh, decision goes through a review for both requirements and code and then gets put into the platform through our normal, our normal sort of deployment procedure. The last thing that we want to do is have this huge bloat of modules. Um, throughout my experience, that's something that a lot of different websites will have. It'll be this, this idea that while there's a module for that, there's also a module for everything. So let's just import all the modules, you know, hundreds of different modules on this platform, hundreds of different pieces of functionality that we can, we can use. Let's just bring all these modules in. We don't want that to happen. What we want to make sure is that we're critically defining the requirements to make sure that only things which will be a benefit to that site and all the other sites on the platform go in there. We want to be keeping that code base lean. We don't want to be recreating the wheel every time. If we can do a bit of functionality, if we can create a bit of functionality using our existing components, if we can twist display suite and configure that in a certain way and talk over here to workbench moderation and use that in a certain way, then we would rather do that and put that in place on the platform then add a new module for every piece of functionality. We're not just working with one site here where that kind of thing is easy to do, where you can say, oh yeah, that, that module will fix it. We're working with an entire platform of hundreds of sites. So we don't want to be adding new pieces of functionality in for all of those. What this has the benefit of for us is that that change management procedure becomes easier. We're able to roll out code very quickly because we're not having to worry about every single individual module that we've added to the platform. We've got these modules that we know about. We've got you know, these things that are core and central to the GovCMS distribution that we know about. And these are the things which we're going to be developing against. 
So as partners and, and developers and, and individual people in the community develop against that, it's not going to be add a new module, add a new module, add a new module. It'll be add this, this portion of functionality that serves the entire code base. We have to remember what brought us here. We have to remember that you know, these bloated silos of, of information were what, what we're trying to come away from. We're trying to make this congruent platform of, of you know, departmental sites. So we want to move away from the idea of just adding in things where they're not needed and thinking about the health of the platform as a whole. So a few of the technical bits about GovCMS, where it's uh, hosted, what the platform is, and how all these things serve to, um, serve to sort of uh, benefit the Australian government. So the cloud that it's running on, due to data sovereignty, it's all in Sydney, all in on AWS Sydney, split across um, their availability zones there to protect from um, from sort of natural disaster and things. Um, we don't sort of get the you know the massive forest fires and uh, and typhoons and tornadoes in Sydney, but it's it's always good to be prepared. So what this involves is from the AWS side, all the network that's all covered. It's all high availability. From the Acquia side, we have 24-7 operational monitoring. We have a person at the hot desk at all times to make sure that if there are any issues, load spikes, traffic increases, or whatever, we're going to be increasing the capability of the platform to deal with that. At the, the other end of the spectrum, if there are sort of terrible issues, we have disaster recovery. We have this baked into the platform. And from Australian government requirements, things that, that uh, we needed to pass for the, the RF assessment, we have seven years of off-site site archival and seven years of off-site log storage. So at some point, five years down the line, if we need to check you know, something five years ago that happened, maybe something in the logs, maybe something that maybe how one of the sites looked, these are things that we can, we can bring back and, um, and take a look at. And all of these are, are there to meet the requirements of, of the government. These things here in the cloud, these are not things that are baked into the GovCMS code base. And this is where GovCMS takes on this idea of not just being code, but being this entire platform and being this, this entire project that um, serves to meet the needs of the Australian government. So on top of the, the AWS cloud, we're, we're working with the Acquia Cloud Site Factory. It's a SaaS application for Drupal. What it does is it allows us to spin up and spin down sites really easily. So it's a you know many sites, one code base idea, this, this massive multi-site. Um, but it allows it to be done in, in a simple way without any code being, being pushed. So in a traditional multi-site, you'd have different code paths for different um, different sites. You'd have different configuration files for different sites and, and specificity on a per site basis. What we do here for the site factory is we can spin up through a user interface as many sites as we want. Um, what that allows us to do, and, and that again sort of serves to the ease of use of GovCMS and the, the ability to spin these sites up quickly, is it takes the effort of creating a new site on a multi-site away from developers. If you look at the GovCMS code base, there's no sort of site specificity in there. All of that is handled by our site factory implementation. So we can have all of these code updates, anything that uh, any kind of security vulnerability that, that comes to the platform, as soon as that goes into our code base, we can roll that out to all sites simultaneously, which is different from the, the sort of standard multi-site procedure where each of those sites would have to be, um, have to be updated one by one. Um, we also have the idea of pre-configured sites. So if a government comes to us and they, or a government department comes to us and they say, you know what, we're not really that crash hot with Drupal. We don't really know too much about how to theme things. We can say, well, have a look at this catalog. Have a look at you know, this portfolio site, this blank portfolio site that, that's been created for this purpose. Or have a look at this blog site or this minister site. And then what you can do is you can clone that and run with it yourself. So there's not going to be any need to you know, develop views for adding news items to the front page. All of these things are in one of our pre-configured sites. And this, again, is speeding up that time that it takes for users and, and departmental users to go from having no site or having a, a site on some legacy platform that's a dog that they are absolutely sick of to having that Drupal site on the new platform with a content, ex content editor experience that's second to none. Some of the tooling that's involved with creating the GovCMS distribution and, and rolling out those deployments. Um, as I mentioned earlier, what, what we tried to do is we tried to get off the island. We tried to you know, ensure that anyone who did PHP development or anyone who maybe knew a lot of Behat or PhantomJS or you know, Thing, they can, they can get involved with this as well. We didn't want to make this you know, a, a Drupal, you know, that golden hammer 
that Drupal golden hammer, we understood that the best thing to manage dependencies for PHP is Composer. We understood that the best way to test a Drupal site isn't simple tests within Drupal. It's all of these other different testing tools that, that we use. So in, in sort of association with Drupal, we're building our platform using Drush Make because we understood that the best way to build a Drupal site, the best way to take those requirements and make a, a Drupal site of it is Drush Make. We have Thing to do all our build processes. Um, and that sort of runs all of our testing using PHP CS and PHP Lint and Behat. And then we have Phantom JS and, um, and again, Behat to sort of go out there and run those tests using JavaScript and things against those real sites, against our, our sort of fully built GovCMS sites to ensure that we're not encountering any regressions. We use Travis CI to, um, and, and GitHub to, to sort of run all of, our, all of our testing framework and also auto deploy out to any mirrors that we have like drupal.org to make sure that whatever the head is, whatever the head of the code base is on GitHub is also mirrored in drupal.org to expand the reach of GovCMS. We wanted to focus on open source here and we wanted to make sure that all of this was, um, was available to, to users of GovCMS and developers on GovCMS. What this does is this allows us to build these sites really quickly. So individual people or individual government agencies who want to download and test GovCMS have to run four commands, and then they have a fully built, fully installed GovCMS site on their you know, laptop or dev server or wherever they want. They download the code base, they change into the GovCMS directory, they run a composer install to bring all our dependencies in, and then they use Thing to build it. It's really simple and really well documented. Similarly with testing, we want to make sure that everything that comes back into the code base meets a bunch of base requirements. So using Travis to automatically test these things, we want to make sure that we're meeting Drupal coding standards because that's the community. Um, that's what the community is used to. But we also want to make sure that you know everything that comes into the platform, whether it's sort of PHP or whether it's the look and feel of the site, meets the general the general standard that we've set for GovCMS. So talking about behavioral testing, what we're doing is we're trying to lower the, ba lower the barrier of entry for um, people to actually contribute to GovCMS. We want to make sure that anyone who wants to write a simple, quick behavioral test can do so. This one here just makes sure that Google Analytics markup appears as, um, as, as it should on the sites. And using, using this kind of format, this kind of testing, it's very simple human language. So we're using the right tool for the job. What we don't want to do is we don't want to make GovCMS this uh, this sort of um, this this beast that other people can't contribute to. We're trying to stick to the tenets of open source and make it easy for people to con contribute to. We're also trying to stick to the uh, the idea that the best tool for the job is the one that allows people to contribute easily. So talking about a few more of those benefits, how we benefit agencies. Um, as I sort of mentioned throughout the course of this talk, we're, we're going to be decreasing the amount of time it takes to get onto the GovCMS platform. We're going to be increasing the ease at which people can onboard to the platform and, um, and have everything sort of taken care of them, all that support, all the monitoring, all the security assessment. We're going to be benefiting Australian residents. And I say, I say residents because I'm not a citizen just yet, so I want this to benefit me too. And it's going to be that familiarity with government sites. You know, Drupal sites are, are quite easy to use from a, a user perspective. They have great navigation, great content architecture. So we want to make sure that all of those sites, regardless of the theme, regardless of the look and feel, have that underlying strong architecture. We also want to make sure that any savings that departments have, and this is important as a taxpayer, are passed on. So the lowered cost of development of coming onto the GovCMS platform, ideally speaking, in an ideal world, that would be passed on by lowering taxes to, um, to residents and taxpayers in the country. The benefit to government employees is one of those other things that, um, that is, is a, a good talking point. We want to make sure that these, gov the, these government employees are exposed to modern tools, modern frameworks, modern PHP standards, and that they can contribute to open source, that they can move between different government departments and not have to reinvent that wheel inside their head. It's that they can sort of take those skills that they've developed for, say, the Department of Communications, and if they move to, let's say, um, you know, the Department of Finance, they've got those transferable skills that they can say, oh, well, I done a bunch of Drupal development. I've done a bunch of Drupal work in my other department. I know how to use this. Or 
I was the lead content author or editor or publisher at the department of um, you know human services or something. How can I move that into my into my new department? Well, it's great. It's Drupal. It's it's going to be the same thing. It's on GovCMS. The other benefit is to the Drupal community as a whole. So within Australia and worldwide, what we want to do is we want to make GovCMS this Drupal exemplar that different stakeholders around the world, different champions for Drupal can say, look, if the Australian government has gone all in on Drupal, all in on government cloud, why can't we? What is so special about us that we can't emulate what an entire government has decided to do? And this is building on what different governments, what the UK government and what the US government are already doing and taking it to that next level to make it um, a whole of government, whole of government idea. So what about the future of GovCMS? Where's GovCMS going now? Um, a lot of these things are, are unknown, but a lot of these things I have sort of ideas where I'd find GovCMS, the, the future of GovCMS really, uh, really interesting. Obviously, there's going to be this expanded functionality. As new sites come on, as new departments on board to GovCMS, these, um, these bits of functionality are going to be shared amongst everyone, and it's going to contribute to GovCMS as a whole. Um, the digital transformation service themselves have some great ideas about having government as an API, and all of this will tie into GovCMS, the platform, the code base, the distribution, to make sure that you know not only are we exposing content to our users, but we're also exposing services to our users. We're going to be allowing users to maybe develop apps against these these websites to to pull down content in different fashions. Um, quite key to this is is something called GovHack. Um, GovHack is a an open open sort of data uh, and hacking event that happens once every year. Um, it happened just a couple of weeks ago. It's all around Australia and New Zealand. And it's uh, where the government's open, where the government departments open up their APIs and allow people to hack against them, to develop apps, develop um, websites and things with the aim of increasing the user experience for all people in the country. So by sort of using that, using that in GovCMS by allowing GovCMS to buy into this idea of government as an API, we're going to be making life a lot easier for these app developers and people who want to expand what we're already building. Um, wider impact on open source, using it as an example. Um, maybe the New Zealand government will decide that they want to emulate this and make KiwiGov. Maybe the Singaporean government will say, you know what, this is such a great idea. The governance behind this is such a great idea. Let's emulate this ourselves. Maybe different universities worldwide will say, hey, this is a great way of managing all departments in a government. I wonder if we could use this as a way of managing all our departments within our university portfolio. All of these are potentials, um, and I'd love to see them come to fruition. I'd love to play a part, play a part in that. Uh, and the final thing to do is to advertise where we are. Focus on GitHub and download us from Drupal.org. Um, the GitHub version is the unbuilt Drush Make um, developer profile for this, and the Drupal.org one is the is the sort of code base as, as it exists, and the you know tar tar gzipped version of the fully built code base because it's Drupal distribution. So by all means, try those, download those, and uh, submit some pull requests. There's a few resources here which I'll skip over very quickly and will be available in the slides. And this is just some stuff from the Australian government. And uh, these are my question pages here for uh, and my, my personal information for you to get in contact with me. Whoo! It's a lot of information, Dan. So a lot of information you know, there. You know, <laughs> it's a poorly kept secret, but <clears throat> When I'm at events, I don't always get to see the session, all the sessions that I want to. And inviting someone on here to present, I essentially get my personal private presentation to catch up on, on, on things that I might have missed otherwise. So thank you very much for that. I really, really enjoyed it. And uh, yes, this was Jams Dev Camp. Thank you, everyone, for listening and watching. Adam and I are available more or less everywhere online for questions. Adam, pretty much, pretty thank much. you. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, I hope your supper is waiting for you now. Yeah, I'm, I'm probably I probably should go and cook that right now. It's uh, yeah. it's it's eight p.m. It's it's definitely definitely my dinner time. Perfect. Hey, Adam, thank you so much for taking the time to put this together for all of us. And uh, I will see you somewhere soon. I hope. Absolutely, I'll, I'll see you soon, Jim. Great. Take care, Adam. Cheers. Thanks. Bye.